Spencer, how did you start making art? Uh, I started as a young kid drawing and doing pointillism. Mm -hmm. You know, did a lot of that when I was in uh, as a teenager. And um, then in my twenties, I used to make what we called musical mobiles, and I would find these weird pieces of metal and sculpt them into these mobiles that wind would go into. And then in my late 20s, I was really taken with Harry Parch, which he invented all these instruments in the 50s and 60s and made a whole orchestra out of them. Uh, and so I made instruments. I had an enzymal chimelzel. Uh, enzymal chimelzel. So an enzymal chimelzel was a pipe organ, the pedals for pipe organ. Uh -huh. I took the assembly and then I tuned all of these titanium pipes, and you play it like a, zym a, a, a xylophone, right. and a xylophone, a xylophone chimelzel. <laughs> then we had the sawzall, which the sawzall was a pipe organ wooden pipe with various saw blades on it uh -huh. that would make noise. Cool. Well, can you describe the time when you first realized that creating was something you absolutely had to do? I was uh, very beginning. And music, the same thing? Yeah, I started playing the piano when I was six or seven. Mm -hmm. And then my grandmother taught me how to play boogie-woogie and blues. And then I started experimenting and writing all my own music. It wasn't really writing, you know, it was putzing around. And I was about 10, 10 uh -huh. or 11. I've always been, I, I love creativity, I love the passion of it. Well, what is it that uh, being creative means to you? <laughs> it fills me up. Ah. It's, yeah. uh, that's what I, I feel fulfilled at all times uh -huh. in creativity, in, in the businesses, the consulting, uh, working on a piano, composing art, even uh, writing a letter to me, making food. It's all the edge of creativity. To me, that's where, like, that's where the air is fresh, clean, and crisp. Is there an artwork here that you're most proud of? Here. Yeah, yeah in the room here. Of course, always the newest. <laughs> <laughs> the newest ones is always the one the that I'm most proud best, of. Huh? Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. <laughs> All right. What's the most important, your most important artist tool? I know for music it would be an instrument, but as an artist, what are your hands? Most, your hands, very good. Because I've realized that my hands have memory, devoid of my body, devoid of my mind and my emotions. That's why when I work, I work on over 25,000 pianos. And that's why if I go into a piano, whether I'm thinking about it or not, my hands know what to do. When I go into, like this right here, I just took apart you know, a, a soprano saxophone for a piece of art that I'm making and cut it all up. Well, my hands know exactly what to do and how to get inside here to do the work they need to do. So I feel very blessed that I was, I was gifted these hands. What kind of creative patterns or routines or, or rituals do you have? Do you have anything like that going on? Where you get up in the morning and you do this, that, and the other? I always turn on music, and I always have three or four or five projects at the same time, and I just don't want to be bothered. I'm just in here listening to old albums mm -hmm. and go for it. I understand perfectly. That's wonderful. How do you know when a work is finished? It tells me. Ah, it speaks to you. Yeah, it's just, when I get to a place of, I go to another place, and it, I always say, does this next thing to it take it to the next place? And if it doesn't, it's just me wanting to, oh, I can do that with it. No, it's time to back off. Uh-huh, uh-huh. What's your favorite thing that you ever created? Is there something that's absolutely your favorite that you've ever done? That's a great 
cost them. It's hard to say because, as I said, every period of time has its own. Mm -hmm. There's no one. Okay. All right. I mean, my albums, some of my records, I was more proud of those than I could have ever, like one song that was gifted me in a dream and I just started playing it when I woke up. That was, of course, that was the best thing that ever happened to me. That's wonderful. Bob. And this, uh, when, I, when we finished Tesla Man after two and a half years, that was that was huge that we turned it on and it worked. Yeah. Uh, what are you trying to communicate with your art? Uh, fun, folly, uh, joy, silliness. Yeah. While being true, I'm really into art. Or not art. I'm into des uh, industrial design objects that are from about 1860, 1870 to about 1930. To me, that was the zone because then. It's where tech, the beginnings of the new technology, the industrial era, uh -huh. hit. They crossed with old world craftsmanship, with new world designs and patterns, with extremely high end uh, um, material. And so I get really inspired. You said what gets me going is that any piece of art that I do, there's nothing faux to it. The pieces on it are from that era. They are real. That was originally what it was there. And when I'm finished with it, I try to see it. That, well, when it's done with it, you look at it and it goes, well, it looks like it should have been that way to begin with. Mm -hmm. it's in, a lot of steampunk art is making something look old or make it look like it should have done something at that time right. by doing painting and all kinds of stuff to it. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's just uh, with me, I, I, I use the original stuff. What's the best advice you've ever had about being, how to be more creative? Has anybody ever given you any advice like that? Yes. Two or three things. One, less is more, get out of my way. Get out of my own way. Two, don't think about it, just start. Just do it. Do it. Just do it. All right. And because eventually, the mistakes show you the ways to where there are no mistakes. Mm -hmm. And there's really no mistakes. Because all of a sudden it turns into something else. Right. Um, three is um, try not to be proud of it. So I've been battling my whole life, okay, I've got something better than anybody else because that's the pattern I was raised with in my uh -huh. home, right. of origin stuff. Right. And to me, it's not about that. It's really about what is it like these things right here. They're just, they're just pieces of metal that somebody created on a piece of paper and melted it and put it in an instrument. So I made music with it for decades. And now I just disassembled it. Lord knows where this has been and who's played and what music has been played or not played. And now if I take credit for anything, how can I with all these other people that come before me? Mm -hmm to get it into my hands. Wow. What was the first tune you learned? A, 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 a standard left-hand boogie with for my grandmother. Really? Very, very simple, but it was hard at the time. So your family was musical? No, right? just my grandmother. Just your grandmother, huh? Uh, well, what about your grandmother? I mean, how? How, where was she with Pam? She, she was uh, very arms. proud that she was a flapper in the 20s uh -huh. and that she was quite the southern belle. I do this whole song about her in the, in my concerts. People love it because I talk about her in her, you know, Spianza. Come here, Spianza. Sit next to me, honey. We're all this piano. Give me a little. Come on, baby. Give me a little sugar. <laughs> and that was her with her two-foot beehive yeah. and the yeah. haircut. And she used to play standards of the 20s through the 40s. And that oh, was her time. Right. So she taught me how to play some of those old blues. And she called them boogie woogie. Boogie woogie. That's how she pronounced it. <laughs> <laughs> well, what famous musicians do you admire? Mus oh, God, there's so many. 
I think Art Tatum. I think the, Art Tatum was hard to fathom. Uh, Jimi Hendrix. All the musicians in the band in the '60s called Gentle Giant. Oh my God, incredible players. Oscar Peterson, as a piano player. Um, Maurice Ravel was phenomenal. Yeah. I mean, I wish we had a recording of Liszt or Chopin. Yeah. Good Lord, that would be that'd be phenomenal yeah. to listen to. Yo Yo Ma. Mm -hmm. um, I love Long Long. Long, long people calling Lang Lang Long Long. I mean, I can go on and on and on. Which of these people have you learned from? I learned from Gentle Giant. Listen to a lot of them. They're very. It's they're like like a musicians' musicians band. I think they broke up in the seventies. Mm -hmm. um, they pushed the boundaries of musically what could happen within that context. Mm -hmm. I listened one. I spent a year once and digested when I probably I was nineteen or twenty a Memphis Slim album. And I learned every piece, and then I transposed it in as many keys as I could so I could learn blues. And oh. it took me a year. Oh, nice. So I could actually go in. So Memphis Slim was big on me. David Grusin, um, when I was doing film scores, Ian you know, Morricone, film scores, uh, John Barry, film scores. Oh, the, those guys are great. Oh, those yeah. guys just nailed me a wall. Because yeah. I, I really got into film score writing there for a while. So mm -hmm. I love that stuff. What about Philip Glass? Anything like that? Philip. He's more of a pattern, a sequencing. Yeah. How Philip does is he gets one or two or three bars, maybe five or six bars of something, and then he repeats it over for five to six straight minutes while going in and out and adding various parts. There's nothing wrong with it. It's, it's mm -hmm. his thing. It's like minimalist uh, symphonic stuff. It's great for dance. Yeah. Uh, but, no, composing, Shostakovich. Shostakovich. Oh, yeah. Debussy, Ravel. Yeah. Um, I mean, I can go on. I, I, I know you could. I know you could. Were you ever influenced by old records and tapes? Oh, yeah, quite a bit. Uh -huh. My parents played Lawrence Welk stuff Yeah. when I was growing up. But I would listen to, you know, just like everybody in the 60s, uh, you know, the Moody Blues and Jimi Hendrix and Led mm -hmm. Zeppelin and, of course, the Beatles. I mean, it's what we grew up with. Right. And then there was an album that came out in the late 50s by a guy named Russ Garcia called Fantastica. And it was the very first time a synthesizer had been used with an orchestral score. It was called Music from Outer Space. And when I used to sell blood to buy records, because um, that's the only way I could get money at the time, go, you know, sell your blood, they give you the money, go buy a record. Sure. Is that I found this weird album, and that really changed how I listened to music. Because here were these lush orchestric scores colliding with this electronic sounds and music. I'm like, whoa, what is that? And it just opened my eyes to a whole other way of hearing right. it. Right. Right. You get still get nervous before a performance or a competition? I never go in competition. No, you don't. I don't believe in competition. Okay. In fact, if there is competition, it won't go. I, I, I thought earlier this year it was a piano con. It's not a competition. Oh, it isn't. No, it's a professional pianist concert. I this see. year was the 27th year, and it celebrates the best of what's around here. I see. And so we all get on stage. People flying from all over the country to see this thing, and now they've gone in, I think it's a dozen, two dozen cities around the country, this model, because they've come and seen it. So we're all on stage in the living room. Mm -hmm. Couches and easy chairs and tables and lamps and, and two concert grand pianos. We all have body mics. We are on stage the whole time. Wow. And you'll hear boogie woogie, then you'll hear jazz, and you'll hear classical, then you'll hear funk, then you'll hear gospel. And we get up, play two songs. We don't know what each one's going to play. We don't know what in order we're in. Oh, interesting. And they were sitting here talking amongst each other in front of the audience, so there's no fourth or fifth wall. And people love it, and we love being up there. So there's zero competition. We celebrate what each one brings to the piano. Do you get nervous before these? No. No? You've done it so often that you don't have. What advice would you give to beginners that were nervous? It's a great one. Actually, uh, a Willis like, gave me this. Yeah? Yeah. Um, she, used to, she once told me, she goes, you know, I used to get really, really nervous on stage going out. I felt almost like puking. And I said, even though I'm on Broadway. And I said, what'd you do? She goes, wiggle your toes right now. I said, what do you wiggle my toes? Just wiggle your toes while you're talking to me. Okay, so I'm wiggling them right now. Yeah. And she said, so tell me what you had for breakfast. I said, Don't stop wiggling your toes. And I'm just wiggling my toes and, 
and talking about it. And then after about 30 minutes, she, says, she goes, how much effort does it take you to keep oiling those toes? And I said, it takes a lot of work to oil your toes. She goes, right, and there your fur's gone. There you go. Then you walk on stage. <laughs> <laughs> Do you teach? Yes, I, I taught. I taught piano teachers, uh, and what I taught them was how to not read music. How to not read music? Yes. What is your music? How to talk the language of music? Ah. Because I have a theory, and the theory is, up until about 1880, most people don't realize this, but it's in the history books. Is to be a great player, you have to do four things. This is lost now. One, you had to be able to read flawlessly. Second, two, you had to have your scales. So you had to be technically proficient. Mm -hmm. Three, you had to be able to compose. Mm -hmm. Four, which is completely lost, is that you had to be able to sight read and then improvise on what you're sight reading. And what occurred was in the late 19th century is that the masters, there all of a sudden became a world of masters. Mm -hmm. Before that was competition. That was, yeah, he's good, there's, there's a whole bunch of them. Right. You got into the list and Chopin's and all of the Romantic eras walking in to the Art Deco, the Art, Art uh, Impressionist era, and teachers stopped asking to compose and to improvise on the masters. Why? Because they thought it was blasphemy to improvise on the masters. Hmm. So what happened over the next century and a half is that all these potential amazing composers or improvisers were never encouraged. Oh. So what I have done is take teachers who can play flawlessly, know the theory, can just play circles around me. Mm -hmm. But I'm into opening up the world of their language of music because they've got it in their hands. They have it in their body. It's just getting the permission and then how do I maneuver it? And every one of them without fail, every one of them, Gary, get hives, some of them cry, some of them go through all kinds of PTSD yeah. because they were taught never to do this. Mm -hmm. And that's how they're teaching their kids. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. That doesn't leave a lot of room for creativity. No, does it? it does not encourage creativity. Yeah. It encourages interpretation. Right. Which is a creative aspect of it. Yeah. But not the peak of creativity. Okay.